is a steel that is immune to the action of the elements. Rain cannot mar its gleaming surface, nor can snow do it any harm. Dust and dirt may fall upon it, but they cannot leave their traces behind. Corrosive agents that soon destroy less durable metals cannot attack it. It withstands high temperatures and high pressures, lasts indefinitely. It is enduro, Republic's perfected stainless steel made in a score or more of chromium and chromium nickel alloys, each designed to meet specific requirements. Enduro's growing popularity and widespread use are a tribute to the progressiveness of modern architects, designers, engineers, fabricators, and distributors. It is our privilege to present briefly the story of Enduro. From distant lands come many of the costly ingredients that contribute to Enduro's corrosion resistance, ductility, and strength. In far off Rhodesia, sturdy natives dig the ores from which its chromium and manganese are refined. And 6,000 miles away in Canada, men of another race mine far underground for the ore from which its nickel is obtained. Various proportions of these and other costly raw materials are blended with iron to produce the different types of stainless alloys. Enduro is born in this house of roaring energy. Only the electric furnace is capable of the absolute control of melting and refining required in making stainless alloys. A large electric furnace, its great white maw open to receive the carefully weighed charge of selected material. One marvels at the operator's skill and delicate judgment in juggling the heavy boxes. A slip might easily damage the furnace. Care must be exercised in distributing the material within the furnace. Now the doors are sealed, the giant electrodes lowered, inferno let loose as the thunder marks attack the charge. The charge is called a heat and is given a number which identifies it. Every piece that reaches the remotest customer can be traced by its heat number. Several hours are required to melt down the material and remove impurities by oxidation. Then the liquid blanket of slag that contains most of these impurities is raked off. After a while, the doors are opened and into the seething mass are shoveled lime, fluor spar, and other materials to protect the molten contents from further oxidation and to remove whatever impurities may still remain. Everything has now been made ready for the addition of other alloys. At various intervals, these are placed in the furnace, the most important being ferrochromium, which has itself been highly refined in an electric furnace. The chromium must be preheated to a cherry red to prevent chilling the bath when it is added. After all alloys have been melted down, after many tests have been made to determine the exact analysis, and all tests approved by chemists, the heat is ready to be tapped or drawn off. The clay plug sealing the tap hole is knocked out with blows of a heavy sled. ponderous furnace is slowly tilted. And a white hot stream of molten steel gushes forth. Tons of incandescent metal flowing as freely as so much water. A final flaming trickle and the ladle with its fiery cargo is ready to be carried away. A screaming siren sounds its warning as the huge ladle starts on its way to the pouring floor. Here, the same degree of skill used in melting the steel must be employed to pour it properly. These molds are carefully prepared in advance. They have been provided with refractory tops to ensure maximum soundness throughout the ingot. Ladle tests are made for each heat and sent to the laboratories to check the analysis of the alloy. For approximately an hour and a quarter, the ingots remain in the molds. 
Then they are stripped from them and transported to the soaking pits. Giant steel fingers place them carefully in this yawning crater. Here they remain until they reach a correct and uniform temperature throughout. Billets from which rods are rolled pass from continuous reheating furnaces through many rolling stands. First roughing rolls and then through the finishing rolls charging back and forth through the rod mill at ever-increasing speed as the diameter is reduced. After the final pass, they shoot out with serpentine swiftness over the beds for cooling. Some bars are cold after first having been annealed and pickled. Cold drawing reduces the diameter, increases the tensile strength, improves the surface, and ensures uniformity of size. Bars are straightened in machines in which a higher finish also is imparted. Enduro also is furnished to all standard dimensions in wire-drawn products. Bars that are supplied for shafting are first rough turned, then centerless ground and polished, then straightened to extremely close tolerances. With micrometer and Ames gauge, which measures the slightest deflection, Republic's inspectors make sure that the size and straightness are accurately checked. Let's take a look into a reheating furnace where slabs have been brought up to proper temperature for rolling into a hot strip. A great strip slab weighing a thousand pounds or more clatters down on the conveying table and is carried to the roughing stand where in clouds of steam it is squeezed by horizontal and vertical rolls until the approximate width and thickness are reached. After many passes, the hot bolt strip leaves the roughing mill and is sent through the finishing mill. At the shears, the end is removed, another bit for the scrap pile. A test piece is sent to the laboratory for examination by metallurgists. The strip is coiled, taken to a scale breaker and roller level, then through an annealing furnace to remove rolling strains. The end sheared off and again a piece sent to the laboratory, recoiled with paper to protect the surface and carried to the pickling department. Here the protecting paper is removed and the spreaders are inserted to assure uniform pickling over the entire surface. In the acid bath, all traces of scale are removed. After washing and cleaning, the hot rolled strip is ready to be cold rolled. Accurately ground and highly polished rolls are used. Keeping these rolls properly surfaced is an important factor in the costs of production. Here is one of Republic's cold rolling mills, especially designed for the rolling of stainless. Rolling enduro is more difficult than rolling ordinary metals. Lighter passes must be employed because it cannot be reduced as rapidly as ordinary steel. It takes much more time and many more passes to reach a specified... Alert operators check the thickness of the material at various intervals and this constant vigilance and careful attention make certain that the gauge of the strip is uniform throughout. The strip receives two passes through the tandem mill and each time is coiled with paper to protect the surface. Then sent through an annealing furnace where the strip, which has become hardened by rolling, is softened by uniform and gradual reheating. The light oxide coating acquired in the furnace is removed by pickling. Passing from the pickling vat, the strip is scrubbed, washed, dried, and recoiled. Cold rolling, followed by annealing and pickling, is repeated until the desired gauge is reached. Strips of the required width are cut in a slitting machine, and again coiled with paper. A high finish is obtained by a light pass through highly polished rolls without reducing the thickness of the strip. A still higher finish is obtained by polishing with high-speed buffing wheels. 
Inspectors carefully check the gauge and closely examine the strip after the polishing operations have been completed. Coiled strip is wrapped in burlap for protection in shipment. For straightened and cut length, the strip is passed through a roller leveler, cut to length according to customer's order and prepared for shipment. While we have been following the manufacture of rod and strip, some slabs have been made ready for rolling into plates and sheets. Notice that all surfaces have been ground to remove any blemishes. A hot time is in store for these slabs, for into a reheating furnace they go. Out of the furnace and slam bang into the jobbing mill. The heavy slab is juggled back and forth and squeezed by the massive rolls. Pass after pass and the slab is gradually lengthened. The final pass in this mill, then quickly before it gets too cold, it is transferred to another mill for finishing. In it goes. Then back through the upper rolls. Then in again. and take it away to the shears where it is cut into short bars for further rolling to the many sheet sizes required. These sheet bars are cleaned by grit blasting, after which they are reheated to rolling temperature. Removed from the furnace and rolled down the finishing mill. After having again been reheated, the sheets are given several passes in another finishing mill. Again and again, the sheets are reheated and rolled until the desired width, length, and thickness have been attained. Then they go to a normalizing furnace to remove strains set up in hot rolling and to develop the best working qualities. Several pickling operations are required. Then the sheets are scrubbed and dried. Then passed several times through a cold reducing mill to improve the hot rolled surface. After which, the sheets again are normalized and given a white pickling operation to obtain the finish known to the trade as number one. Higher finishes such as number two B are obtained by additional cold rolling. Where only ordinary flatness is required, sheets are roller level. Oftentimes, special flatness is required. In those cases, the sheets are stretched in a powerful machine known as a stretcher or patent leveler. This mechanical tug of war ensures utmost flatness. All sheets are trimmed to size and every sheet carefully inspected before it is approved for shipment. Republic has developed many special methods of grinding and polishing. Only at great expense and through the concerted efforts of capable men, well equipped to solve every production problem, has it become possible to attain the high standard of quality and uniformity of finish so characteristic of enduro sheets. The first step in polishing a sheet is to grind it down with a coarse grit to get to the very bottom of any minute surface imperfection. Slowly, back and forth, the sheet travels in close contact with the rapidly revolving and oscillating roll. After coarse grinding, sheets are stretcher leveled to ensure maximum flatness in the finished product. The sheet then is polished with finer abrasives while grease is applied. The surface begins to take on luster. The oscillating movement of the polishing roll is most important as it assures a smooth surface free from streaks or grinding lines. The sheet you see going through this machine is receiving the third of the many polishing operations required. Again, grease is applied as the polishing continues and gradually an overall uniform luster is imparted to the sheet. And now, 
number four finish, the most widely used. The sheet is cleaned with whiting. As the operator wipes it, the shimmering surface appears in all its stainless beauty. Note the paper placed over it to prevent any possible damage to its surface. The same scrupulous care is plainly evident through the many finishing operations. The distinctive Tampico or satin finish known as number six is obtained by passing number four finish sheet under a special brushing roll as an oily compound of fine pumice and lime is applied. As the sheet slowly passes back and forth many times, a silvery satin finish gradually appears. Higher finishes also are available. For instance, the number seven finish, which has a very high luster, as you can see, as the operator cleans this sheet. And then comes number eight mirror, the ultimate in stainless finishes. To obtain this beautiful surface, the finest polishing compounds are used in preparing the sheets. After this follows prolonged buffing with special compounds, an operation that calls for great skill. Any defect, no matter how slight, shows up when this high finish is reached. The operator critically examines his work to be sure the sheet has attained Republic's standard of perfection. <laughs>